Reportedly, Lou Holtz, the longtime coach of Notre Dame, once said, want to be happy for an hour, eat a steak. Want to be happy for a day, play golf. Want to be happy, hang on a minute there. Yeah, want to be happy for a week, go on a cruise. Want to be happy for a lifetime, put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, of course, we have to be careful these days about quotes attributed to well-known people, right? That's why I always try to remember the wise counsel of Abraham Lincoln. Don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture or a quote next to it. I don't have the exact date when Lincoln said that, probably right after the Gettysburg Address, right? But anyway, back to what Holt said. Those words aren't just cornbread advice. That really is a biblical principle, to avoid the temptation of immediate gratification and instead make choices that are considering the long-term results. You know, one of the key examples in the Bible about that very topic is Jacob's brother Esau. You remember his story is summarized in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, where we read that there would be no immoral or godless person. You don't want to be that, do you? That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau. And what did he do? He sold his own birthright for a, a single meal. In other words, he gave up his position in God's covenant plan just to satisfy his, his hunger. In fact, if you remember that story, his exact words were, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff, that, that, that stew that his brother was making. Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff, therefore I am, I, I'm famished. So Jacob, his conniving brother, said, first sell me your birthright. Remember what Esau said next? He said, behold, I I'm about to die. Doesn't that sound just like a man right there? I I I'm about to die. So of what use then is the, the birthright to me? Do you see how powerful and deceptive the temptation of immediate gratification can be? I I'm about to die. So what, is, what use is my place in the plan and purpose of the eternal God of heaven and earth? Can you think of decisions you had to make even this week or this past month where, where it came down to that? It came down to a choice between either immediate gratification or developing a lifestyle of faithfulness and, and endurance and, and fruitfulness. No, no doubt, we all face that whether we're talking about finances or relationships or eating or exercise or anger or lust or entertainment or, or dozens of other topics that we could list this morning. It, we, we've all learned the hard way that, that giving in to immediate gratification rarely takes you to a good place. Now, now, now here's another piece of this puzzle. One of the tools that our God uses to help us in this matter is his fatherly discipline. Think about that. The writer of Hebrews said it like this, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. Is that one of the most understated principles in scripture right there? All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, there it is, afterwards it yields the, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You know, that's a very good way to think about all of life's choices. What's going to happen afterwards? With that in mind, since we've already referenced this passage a couple of times, let me now ask you to turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, that's on page 176 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you. So Hebrews chapter 12 or page 176 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you. We're talking this morning about our Father's loving discipline. And I do wonder how many followers of Jesus Christ even have a category in their mind for this topic. Our Father's loving discipline. It's part of our emphasis all month long on stewardship of challenging times. We set aside every November to focus on stewardship around here. And that's a word, if you're not familiar with it, that simply means God-given responsibility with accountability. And for decades now, our church family has memorized the, the four principles or four factors of stewardship. 
In fact, you could just poke people around you right now, and even before they remember their name, they would just be able to give you the four factors of stewardship from memory. Now, wouldn't we? So God owns everything. You own nothing. That's where it starts. God entrusts you with, with everything that you have. Thirdly, you can either increase or diminish what God has given. He, he wants you to increase it. And lastly, God can call you into account at any time, and it may be today. And if you've um, not yet memorized those, here's homework assignment number one uh, of many homework assignments you'll receive during Stewardship Month that would be to, to memorize the, the four factors of stewardship. And even more importantly, look for opportunities throughout the week to make decisions and choices in a way that's consistent with those biblical principles. Well, well, this year, because of everything that's been occurring in our culture, everything happening in our world, even in our individual lives, we, we thought it would be timely and appropriate to, to focus this fall on the stewardship of trials and hard times. But especially with this, with an emphasis on how God can empower us to handle these difficulties well in a way that produces a kind of character and faithfulness that trips to the ice cream shop probably won't. So all month we're talking about stewardship of challenging times. Now, now in addition to hearing a series of messages on this topic, we're also going to be hearing stewardship testimonies from your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think part of the joy of being in a church family is hearing what God is doing in various aspects of stewardship among the men and women who are part of this church. And I'm very thankful for those who are just opening up their hearts and opening up their lives and, and helping us not glorify them, but helping us glorify our Savior who, who is fulfilling his promise to work his will out in and through them. Then as Pastor Johnny mentioned, we're also going to com culminate all of this with our annual stewardship celebration. That, that's always the Sunday night before Thanksgiving. Isn't it amazing we're already talking about Thanksgiving? The Sunday night before Thanksgiving, and it comes fairly early this year. It's November the 21st, and I hope every person attending our church, even if you've not yet chosen to become a member, I hope you'll plan to join us. It's at the Faith East Community Center this year, so November the 21st, and the theme of that evening is going to be Portraits of Perseverance. Again, we always want to end these conversations on hope. We want to end these conversations on what the Lord can do in and through us. And so we're planning an entire series of stories from men and women who, by God's grace, have endured. They're moving toward what this particular passage promises, the, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Don't you want to be moving toward that? Let's find out from this passage how that's even possible. So Hebrews chapter 12 Beginning in verse 1, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and that's referring, of course, back to Hebrews chapter 11, which we often refer to as the Faith Hall of Fame. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with what? With endurance, the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on whom? On Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, did what? Endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You've not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Do you believe that? Could I get a mm-hmm on that? Are you glad about that? Does he love you more than anybody else? Yes, 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 yes. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It's for discipline that you... Endure, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, I hope, 
And we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. He disciplines us for our good so that we may what? Share his holiness. Here's the verse I mentioned a moment ago. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, here's what you do. Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. And if you say, well, I don't like this and I'm not going to do it, where is that going to take me? Well, thank you for asking. Verse 15, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of Here's where it'll take you. If you choose not to allow God to help you endure, if you don't respond properly to his loving discipline, here's where you will end up every time. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterward, here's a haunting verse. For you know that even afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for him, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Don't you love the word of God? No human being would have ever written that. So we're talking this morning about our Father's loving discipline. And with the time we have remaining, let's just walk our way through the logic of this passage and look for three necessary responses to challenging times. We all have challenging times, right? While they're everywhere, praise God that he's given us a book that is absolutely sufficient and a Savior who stands ready to help us understand and obey it. So three necessary responses to challenging times. First of all, remember God's exhortation about discipline. And we probably need to get this issue out of the way before we go any further. The Bible uses the word discipline much more broadly than we do in our culture. Now, oftentimes we think about punitive discipline. In other words, a person did something wrong and now they have to face the consequences so they're being disciplined. Well, the Bible's definition includes that concept, but as I mentioned, it's much broader. In fact, I think a better English word for what we're talking about in this passage is the word training. It's everything the Lord brings into our lives, including the difficulties that come from living in a sin-cursed world that can help mold and conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, now, no doubt, as we were reading, I hope you saw this constant emphasis on the matter of developing endurance. Don't you want that? If you respond properly to God's disciplining hand, part of the result will be endurance. And you saw it all over the passage. So in verse 1, let us run with endurance. In verse 2, for the, the joy set before him, he endured the cross. In verse 3, who has endured such hostility against himself. Then in verse 5, don't don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Or or don't faint when you're reproved by him. Then in verse 7, it's for discipline that you endure. In in, in verse 10, he he disciplines us for our good. Why? So that you may may share his holiness. That's part of what happens when you learn endurance. Or to those who have been trained by it, afterwards, afterwards, afterwards. It yields something that's good. The the, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Or so that the, the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint. Then Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal, and even afterwards, in his case, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance. You know, you might even want to pause right now and just ask yourself, how are you doing at that matter of developing endurance? It's the word hupomone. It's a steady determination to keep going. I would just ask you this morning, is that the way you live? Is that the path you are on? You're becoming, more and more over time, you're becoming a person of endurance. 
Now, a couple of other observations from these first three verses. Thankfully, we don't have to go first. Right, we have this great cloud of witnesses. We have the men and women highlighted in chapter 11, the the Faith Hall of Fame, who are real-life examples of people who handled God's discipline well. And also, let's keep in mind throughout this entire month, all of this points directly to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the author and he's the perfecter of our faith. Aren't you glad for that? Both sides. He's the author of our faith. If he hadn't authored it, we wouldn't have it. And he's also the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down of the right hand of the throne of God. That, by the way, is the perfect example of how not all discipline is punitive in nature. This book and many others tells us very clearly our Lord never sinned. And yet he was the model of faithful endurance. So how do we get there? I hope already you're saying in your heart, I want to be a person of endurance. I want to take steps in this way. So how do I get there? This passage affirms we have to choose to remember God's exhortation about discipline. Or another way of saying that is we have to choose to to think biblically about the challenges we face In fact, before we even walk through the logic of these next verses, I would encourage you to think about a difficulty you're facing right now. And then think about how the world might encourage you to respond, many times by a choice of immediate gratification, or how your flesh might be motivating you to respond, again, with some choice regarding immediate gratification And then compare that to what it would be like to put on a a biblical pair of glasses. To to think about the difficulty that you're facing right now through the lens of Hebrews chapter 12, where, where you could honestly say, I am choosing to remember God's exhortation about discipline. Well, what is that exhortation? Don't diminish discipline's potential value. And you've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. That's what had to be said to some of the recipients of the book of Hebrews. I hope that doesn't have to be said about you and me. You've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, don't regard lightly the the discipline of the Lord. So so let's say, for example, the the difficulty. I've, I've mentioned this several times already. Think about a difficulty in your life. Maybe one of the ones that comes to your mind is a difficulty you're having with a friend. Because that person disappointed you in some way. Friends have a way of doing that, right? Well, what's the immediate gratification approach to that one? When somebody in your life disciplines you, what's the helping of red stuff in Esau-type terminology on that one? Well, it's to blow up or to cut the person off. It's to, to go find another friend. And all of that might feel really good temporarily. And you realize for some people, that's their entire life story. Short-term friendships that get discarded as soon as there's a problem. Well, what's wrong with that? Frankly, a lot. But including how it fails to see the value of relationship problems as part of God's fatherly discipline in our lives. You may have had a friend, a loved one, somebody that's close to you, really honked you off this week. In fact, you were steaming about it when you came into the church house this morning. To what degree have you thought about that relationship difficulty through the lens of that's part of God's fatherly training? He entrusted me with that particular problem. See, the writer of Hebrews says, don't regard challenges like that lightly. Why? Why? Because if you you stay in there... If you learn to communicate and solve problems biblically, what's going to happen in your life afterwards? The peaceful fruit of righteousness. You do not develop that fruit overnight. You don't get there through giving in to the choice of immediate gratification. Another facet of God's exhortation is don't quit. Don't quit. You've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. No, do what? Nor nor faint when you are reproved by him. 
sociologists are suggesting this is the year of the grand resignation. It's amazing how many people are quitting their jobs. And I'm not saying, by the way, that that's always sinful. That's not my point. But I am going to tell you this. If you quit whatever you're doing, whenever it gets hard, you are often missing out on a growing opportunity. In fact, some of us were raised in homes where if you joined a sports team, what? You stayed on that team until the end of the season. And it didn't matter if you liked the coach. It didn't matter if you got all the playing time you thought you deserved. Right? The disappointments that came with that pursuit were part of the equation, and we weren't allowed to quit. That was part of God's discipline. Am I talking to anybody? You wanted to quit, and your daddy said, you ain't quitting. You ain't quitting. Stop your fussing and whining. You ain't quitting. In fact, you're not quitting because I bought you a new pair of shoes in order for you to participate in that sport. And until those shoes are totally worn out, I don't even want to hear quitting come off those lips of yours. You glad for a daddy like that? You probably weren't on that day. You pouted and whined. Didn't ya? But you're glad for a daddy like that today if God gave you one that was part of God's discipline in your life, those disappointments. I don't know if this is true or not, but I recently read that the average marriage in the United States now lasts eight years. And that's not a swipe at people here who might be divorced. And we do believe that the scripture has grounds for divorce. So that's not why I said that. But I am going to say this. There are trends in this entitlement culture that wants to label all problems everybody else's responsibility and therefore a justification for heading for the exits quickly in complete disregard for what this passage of Scripture is saying. And every one of us, listen, you're married to an imperfect person and your spouse is married to a really imperfect one. And if you say, I didn't like you saying that, feel free to send me an email. But, but that is the truth of living in a um, sin-cursed world. And every one of us has to ask the question, what role does the concept of God's loving fatherly discipline play in the way you process disappointments in your life? And you say, what are you saying? That my spouse's um, imperfections are part of God's sovereign plan? That is exactly what I'm saying. Otherwise, you are living in a world that you think is out of control, with a God who is out of control. What role does God's fatherly discipline have in the way you process the disappointments in your life, including the disappointments you face in your marriage? I've had the occasion many times to encourage pastors just to stay in there and ride out whatever challenges they're facing in there. It's amazing how many pastors have quit in the last 18 months. 1 Corinthians 11:19 says this, there must always be divisions among you. There's a happy pastor verse right there. There's a happy local church verse right there, and that is exactly what Paul told the Corinthians. There must how often Once every five years? No, there must always, always be divisions among you. And Paul explains why. So that those who are approved may become evident. I remember one particular occasion. I'm I'm holding the receiver of the phone, uh, talking to a pastor. I said, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. And the reason is often such a person is on the cusp of significant growth But all of that is short-circuited if you take an early run to the exits. And some pastors get into a bind and they quit after five years and they go to another place and there's the honeymoon period, but then they get in a bind and they quit after five years and they quit after five years and they quit after five years. And so by the time 40 years of ministry is over, they've pastored eight churches for five years. And if that guy says, I have 40 years of pastoral experience, no, he doesn't. No, he has five years of pastoral experience, repeated eight times in a row. And all of the opportunities for growth, all of the opportunities for development that would have come in his heart and life and character if he hadn't quit so quickly had been lost. There was no, there was no endurance. Now, if you say, I don't, I don't like what you're saying this morning. Well, we're not anywhere near done. 
because this passage isn't anywhere near done. Discipline is a, a sign of our, our sonship. And by the way, speaking of done, you, you, you want a you Halloween haunting thought? I jumped in the Jeep this morning and I, I drove halfway down my driveway and realized I did not have my watch on. I didn't have my watch on. And so I, I said, where's my watch? And I actually stopped the Jeep and I went back and I could not find my watch. I could not find my watch this morning. Can you, I, I did find it over here. I had left it here when I was studying last night. But can you imagine a preacher without a watch? That would be a, that would be a terrible thing. This sermon never ends. Of course, as you know, I, I rarely look at the thing. But anyway, it is, it is here for reasons I forget right this very minute. But anyway, Hebrews 12, 7. It's for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline any of us who have raised children, we know that to be true, right? I was in a parking lot the other day where there was a poor mom with a toddler who was pitching a royal fit. In fact, this little guy had perfected even the tone at which he was screaming to be especially annoying, to, to, not just to his mom, everybody. But I thought, boy, everybody within a mile of where we're standing right now is being annoyed by this little guy. And what's the temptation in that moment? Give him whatever he wants. In fact, I, I was thinking to myself, listen, I got some candy. I got, I got some money. You, you can drive my Jeep, but would you stop? Just, just make it stop. Well, is that what a loving parent with an eye to long-term results is going to do in that moment? No. And then we have this crucial verse which reminds us, pursue discipline's goal. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And it might be helpful for us for a moment just to back up and think about the book's original audience. That The epistle of Hebrews is written to a group of Jewish persons who had left the temple some of them had genuinely placed their faith and trust in Christ and become part of the church. Others had just come along, but we don't think they had yet become Christians. That's why the book reads the way it does. But what was the problem? The problem was the newness of the church was wearing off. And the pressures they're now facing were for the moment seeming not to be joyful. And I would just ask you, do you have anything like that in your life where the newness is wearing off? You ever thought of that as a stewardship? As something that your heavenly father has entrusted to you? And what would be different if you focused more on the long-term result and less on the short-term pain or discomfort? Now, now to help us in this endeavor, the, the next verses give us specific steps. What can we do? in order to get to a better place. And the passage is clear. Well, you have to strengthen weaknesses that discipline reveals. Therefore, strengthen your hands that are weak. Strengthen the knees that are feeble. So for, let's just say, for example, somebody here would say, well, I'll tell you for me, when I face some kind of uncertainty, that's God's discipline in my life. When, when I don't know exactly what's going to happen next, and I really want to, and I start giving in to sinful worry, so that's the sin that so easily besets me, mentioned in verse 1 of this chapter. And what was it that revealed that weakness, that propensity to, to worry? The answer is an occasion of God's fatherly discipline. So what does this verse say you ought to do next? Well, you ought to put yourself on a workout plan. Right, pick up a book on how to handle worry biblically or, or establish some accountability partners who will help you avoid sinful worry. But the point is, strengthen the hands that are weak. And so if God's fatherly discipline reveals a particular weakness in your heart and life, what specific step do you need to do in order to strengthen your hands and your knees in that particular area? And then straighten your path. And make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but, but rather be healed. Somebody else this morning might say, my problem is when I face adversity, I start complaining. There, there's no short, straight path that has the word complaining in it. So you're just going zzz, 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 right, round and around and around and around. And then worse, you may have surrounded yourself with some complainers. And what's that like? What are those, those conversations like? Zzz, 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 zzz. 
And if I had more arms, I would do more zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
becomes front and center in all of this. A, a Christian's endurance is not secured by pulling ourselves up by our own spiritual bootstraps. It's during a period of his fatherly discipline, crying out to our crucified and risen Savior for strength and enablement that only he can give. And see, the approach that's articulated in these verses, that, that makes you want to do something, right? To reach out, to, to cry out for God's grace. That's where you want to be. I recognize God's fatherly discipline in my heart and life. I recognize what he's called me to do as a believer. And so now I'm reaching out for his grace. If you're reaching out for God's grace during a time of his fatherly discipline, you're not going to fall short of it. Can you think of a, a wonderful example in the New Testament of a man who was clearly experiencing God's loving fatherly discipline in his life and he cried out for deliverance and found a fresh measure of God's sufficient grace? I'm talking about Paul. As he wrestled with his thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, here's how he described it. Because of the surpassing, and every one of these words is so important, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, in other words, God was giving him the Bible, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, that's what his fatherly discipline can do. It'll knock the pride out of you. To keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me, he says it twice, to keep me from exalting myself. That is a marvelous way to think about the importance and the role of God's fatherly discipline. But he didn't just suffer in silence, did he? It's fascinating what we read next. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times. That's spiritual authenticity. Well, did God remove it? When Paul asked the Lord three times to, to remove the thorn in the flesh, did God remove it? <laughs> no, no, no. Here's what happened. He said to me, my, my grace. See, don't fall short of God's grace. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And then here's what Paul said. Can you say this about the, the, um, the, the instance of his fatherly discipline in your life right now? Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses. Could I get a mm-hmm on that? Or is Jesus your Santa Claus? I'm only happy if he's bringing me stuff in his sleigh so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulty for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And see, when we steward challenging times well, we have the potential to receive God's grace and to, to learn about God's grace in entirely new ways. Let me just pause and talk to someone who might be here who is not yet a follower of Jesus Christ. Friend, that might be the ultimate sense in which you don't want to fall short of God's grace. In fact, that very well may be why God is allowing the trial in your life that you're currently facing. It's to bring you to the end of your strength and to bring you to the end of your wisdom and to bring you to the end of your resources so that you will reach out with empty hands and acknowledge, I need the grace of God that is only available through trusting the finished work of his son. That's why Paul told the Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Don't fall short of the grace of God. And if you've not yet trusted Christ, I would encourage you to run, not walk to the cross. And to acknowledge your need and choose today to place your faith and trust in him. Cry out for his grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one would boast so, so back to the main point we're pursuing. When we steward challenging times well, we have the potential both to receive God's grace and to learn about God's grace in an entirely new way. But what's the alternative? What about anyone who would say, I have no intention of doing anything that we have talked about this morning? Well, here's the answer, a life of bitterness. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble, and by it many are defiled. 
Friends, whenever you and I fail to steward God's loving fatherly discipline well, bitterness is the inevitable result. And did you see how this passage describes the process? It's like a root, which is terminology that comes from Deuteronomy 29, which emphasizes the role of unbelief in all of this. And you might say, well, look, I don't have any bitterness in my life at all. (laughs) Oh, really? Have you checked the garden of your heart carefully? Because, friends, here's what the Bible teaches. It starts very small. And if it's not addressed both quickly and completely, what is bound to happen? It'll spring up. You ever noticed in a garden how if the person in charge doesn't pull the weeds right away, you you neglect it for a week or two, and then what do you have? You have a jungle that's quickly taking over all the flowers and all the vegetables and all the fruit. And there may be people listening to this message today, and the truth of the matter is you've not been a good steward of God's fatherly discipline in your life, and bitterness is starting to spring up. And it's clouding everything. It's clouding every conversation. It's clouding every experience. It's clouding every relationship. It's springing up. And when that happens, what's next in the passage? It'll cause trouble. That's a biblical promise. Bitterness will never take you to a good place. It'll lead to words you shouldn't have said or choices you shouldn't have made. And don't miss this. All the while, you will be convinced it's somebody else's fault. But at the core, at the core, it is a failure to steward God's fatherly discipline well. And I realize there may be somebody who's here this morning who is not real happy with me right now. Well, can I give you yet another word of pastoral caution? Bitterness will make a liar out of you every time. That's where this passage ends. The longer you fail to steward God's loving fatherly discipline well, when you stew in this ever-growing batch of bitterness, here's what's going to happen. You will rehearse that story of that person's failure in your mind over and over and over, and every time you tell yourself or somebody else the story, the other person is going to come out a little worse, and you're going to come out a little better. You say, how do you know that? That's what happened to Esau. This passage is trying to help us reject immediate gratification, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. And if you know your Bible well, you might be saying, you know, that's not the way Esau told the story. Don't miss that. That is not the way Esau told the story. You remember after Esau's brother Jacob and his mom concocted that plan to deceive daddy and receive the first, this was a messed up family, but do you remember what happened? This is Genesis 27, 34. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and what? Mara, bitter cry, and said to his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. And his father said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then he said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he supplanted me these two times. He did what? He stole, he took away my birthright. And behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And I'm not suggesting that Jacob and their mom was innocent. They were a messed up family. But what detail did Esau get terribly wrong? Jacob did not take away his birthright. He sold it. Immediate gratification for a mess of that red stuff. And I'm convinced that Esau repeated that lie to himself over and over and over to the point he actually believed it was true. And do you realize what that means? The longer you fail to steward God's loving fatherly discipline well, the more likely it is that your recollections are filled with self-induced falsehoods. That's what I mean when I say bitterness will make a liar out of you and me every time. And that's why it would have served Esau to repent far sooner than he did Because this passage ends with one of the more haunting concepts in all of Scripture. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, that is, by his father. 
for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. And if you're thinking of times when you reach for immediate gratification, when you were experiencing an occasion of God's loving fatherly discipline, here's what ought to happen now. Repent quickly before bitterness springs up and causes trouble and defiles many. And if you would say, well, we're too late for that, it's already sprung up and caused all sorts of trouble, friend, I would encourage you to talk to those people and repent of that sinful bitterness as quickly as you possibly can to receive and understand God's grace in an entirely fresh way. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, Lord, thank you that you truly love us as our heavenly father. And you know exactly what balance of blessings and discipline we need every day in order to put us in the best position to become more and more like your son. And Father, we admit this morning that too often we we get mad about your fatherly discipline. We, we, We refuse even to acknowledge your role in it. And as a result, we, we often just reach for some aspect of immediate gratification. And Lord, if that's true, I pray that you would help us to repent of that. For any of us who would say that we've allowed a root of bitterness to spring up and cause trouble and defile many, Lord, I pray that we would admit that. I pray that we would not just focus on their their wrong aspect of it. I pray that we would focus on how we failed to, to grasp the grace of God when it was there for us. And Lord, thank you that there's nobody here today who is at this moment beyond repentance. We thank you that you're a loving, forgiving God. And if we have a pulse, you are willing to forgive. And so, Father, I pray that we would steward the episodes of your fatherly discipline well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.